Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson and today we are going to be rejoining Laird Baron for part two of our conversation. If you missed part one, all you need to do is head back one episode to episode 207 In that conversation, we speak to Laird about his new novel, Blood Standard, crime fiction, and toning down the weird. But remember, as always, you can listen to these podcasts in any order. So, by all means, listen to this episode and then head back to 207. Before we get into the conversation, let's have a quick word from our sponsors. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like podcasts of Stephen King? Do you like spooky magazines? Good news! Now you can have a St- Stephen King podcast, Castle Rock Radio. And you can have a spooky magazine, Dark Moon Digest. All you have to do, go to www.patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. Have a scary day! And the second sponsor is the This Is Horror Podcast Patreon. And when you become a patron, you get early bird access to every episode. You can submit a question for the interviewee. You get our patrons only Q&A sessions with myself and Bob Pastorella. And a lot, lot more. And remember, for every 25 patrons, we get over 100 we will support another creator and right now we're getting close to 125 so if you pledge a dollar not only are you helping the this is horror podcast but in a way you're indirectly helping another creator within the horror community so if you want to become a patron head over to www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror And with that said, let us not delay. Let's get into part two of the conversation with Mr. Laird Barron. And now for a horror interview. Well, Dino Parenti says, whether writing horror or crime, do you find yourself either sparked by an emotion and then craft a character or plot around that emotion or do you generally start from a place of character plot first and let whatever emotions come in the process? Does one genre, horror or crime, dictate either process more than the other? You know, I haven't, uh, it's kind of interesting because I do, I analyze everything. I haven't ever, I've never thought about it quite in that granular a sense, um, and and so I reserve the right to change my <laughs> my stance on this or my thinking about it uh, in the future. But at the the moment, my my reaction is I sort of approach everything the same the same way, unless I'm doing a, a stream of consciousness kind of a thing. I have a tendency, uh, and it's and, 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 and this is going to maybe be a frustrating answer, but sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other. Uh, in the case of uh, the crime fiction, is really specific. I mean, I think maybe that's what I'm, I'm kind of grappling with here. Is the is the crime fiction is really specific because it's a specific genre. It has there are specific expectations, especially writing a series. And so, uh, not to say you can't do baroque and crazy things. Just look at Hannibal, uh, or look at Elizabeth Hand. You know, with her cast and There's all kinds of things that you can do that that take you off into the weeds or, you know, into, 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 into down seldom traveled paths. But that said, when you're writing that kind of material, you're starting from a, you're starting in known territory, like well-known territory. Uh, and, and probably, you know, it isn't just that it's crime or noir. I think category fiction of any kind, whether it's romance or horror or whatever, you, you are, you know, it tends to start in the known, in the known territory of a, of a tradition. Uh, and so, in that sense, um, the character was really, really important to me. Uh, as far as his, and, and you know what, and I, and I guess in a lot of ways his emotions were important to me because when I, 
you know, the, the beginning of the of Blood Standard is quite different now than what it was uh, up until almost. Well, actually, it changed even after it was acquired. I worked with the editor on 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 the first few chapters, like not necessarily rewriting them or anything, but just saying, hey, you know, would it be better if the story started here than rather than here? But what Coleridge was feeling was really was really important to me, and I think that's also this is really funny because you know obviously this story starts off in Alaska, and Alaska will continue to be an integral part of his his character, but whether he ever goes back or not is another question. But it's all it's part of him. I have to say, uh, what he was feeling uh, was far more important at the time in any plot. I had no idea what the plot was. I simply just sat down and put him in a situation and then started creating why he was in this situation. And of course it gets easier. I find like the second novel is even easier to come up with stuff for him because I know him now. I know why he'll, how he'll respond to things. Uh, now on the other end of it, when I'm writing horror, if I'm writing horror that has a powerful crime component or a noir component, then it's really similar. It's it, it's really similar to uh, writing the, the straight crime fiction with with Coleridge in the sense that I start with character like Nanashi uh, in Man with No Name. I start with with Nanashi. There's some really weird, crazy stuff going on, but I had to get into him. I had to know what made him tick, and that was more initially that was far more important to me when I was putting the puzzle together than than the overall picture. Um, and like I said, so the same thing with Coleridge. Now, I'll, some of my other horror, uh, it it could very well be that um, you know it's less about the it's less about uh, the character and their emotions and more okay. I, I know this is this is a story about uh, cults and old leech and whatnot, and so I start from a point of events. Like I start looking at what would be some great events. What events do I want to write about? Uh, so I hope that, I mean, I, I don't know if that's helpful or not, but it's, it's, uh, and it, the problem is, is that it's, uh, you're in shifting, you know, for me, writing is, it's like, it's, it's shifting ground. It's never as simple as saying, this is what it's going to be about. And this is what I'm going to focus on at the time. I, I find that I, uh, some days when I'm writing, it's all about, uh, imagery and, and, and sequences of events, you know, action or or uh, or 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 people or people feeling what they feel. And other days, it's completely about plot. Like, how am I going to move these characters around, and how am I going to reverse engineer this mystery? And so it's it's no matter what I'm writing, it's never it's it, it's I don't think there's ever any time when it's 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 always clear uh, that one type of approach is going is going to be applicable on it on a given day i find that i have to be quick on my feet and not so much go with where it takes me but be prepared to deal with with what my subconscious is is putting forth uh, i mean i i guess maybe that's the too long didn't read take away from this whole thing is that i wrestle with my subconscious everything comes out of my you know i sit around and consume and then I dream, and then I and then I, I sit down and I open up that box, and the creature comes out of the box, and I have to wrestle with it and try to get something coherent, you know, out of that interaction. And and sometimes it's easy, and it's it's uh, uh, you know takes the form of plotting, and other times it's stream of consciousness that I have to go back and and edit later. Which I which I in both books I actually I wrote a lot of stream of consciousness stuff, and then of course went back through and 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 cleaned it up and. And distilled it down to uh, you know something more uh, traditional or or commercial. It's almost like what you said earlier about how <clears throat> you can use you know landscape as character, mm-hmm. and you tie it in with landscape and circumstances, and you can use that as a springboard as character as well. Especially if you're going back to you know like your old leech stories, things like that. Uh, even even with your with your current crime series, you, you know you have you have a, a, a cir- circumstances, and uh, I can see how that could definitely inform it. Yeah, I, you know, and this is a product of my upbringing. I was raised, you know, and here's the thing: I don't know if I've ever really made this clear, but you know, I wasn't <laughs> wasn't born, you know, 
in a in a in a hut in the woods. I mean, we lived in we lived in a small, you know, somewhat rural town for a long time, and then when we moved out in the woods, um, there were times where we, you know, I, I would say like from the time I was nine till I was about eighteen, seventeen, we you know we lived primarily uh, in a cabin in the in the woods, but we also migrated. There were times where we would spend a few months uh, in the suburbs, uh, or like I said, the time that my uncle, you know came to this place, uh, it was, it was out in the country, but you could drive to it. It was just a down an old, like literally down an old road in a hollow and a swamp, which it may as well have been the, you know, it's a, it's a swamp in Alaska and a hollow somewhere. And, you know, I think by most people's standards, it was probably the wilderness, but by ours, it was, that was town living. So, so, you know, I had experience, uh, living in a lot of different places in Alaska, some of them more rural than others, but, um, you know, it really imprinted imprinted upon me, and not necessarily in kind of the Zen way that I think some people. You know, I'd probably be very smart to package it up and and, and make it be more feel good than it really is. Uh, I'd probably make a lot more money, but I have a real adversarial relation. You know, I guess that's the right word: adversarial relationship with the wilderness, especially Alaska wilderness. Um, you know, I don't, it, to me, it's very realistic as opposed to, um, I don't know, ennobled in some way, you know, uh, it's not, it's, it's, it's not, uh, a, a hippie, uh, oneness with nature. Nature is red of tooth and claw and it will eat you if it, if it can. And whether that's the Alaska, Alaskan wilderness or whether you go up in the Catskills and break your leg on a hiking trail and nobody knows you're there, you know. Uh, I'm very conscious of the uh, uh, the fact that if we stop building and up maintaining, that even our greatest cities would uh, be overgrown. You know, within a few generations, you know, you would the the, the earth would reclaim it to some degree, uh, and ultimately, uh, completely. And when I say adversarial, I don't mean necessarily as a, as an enemy. I don't. You know, I don't live in dread of the wilderness, anything like that. I just, I recognize though that it's, that it's not our pal. That we, that we, we, you know, that we're basically in a symbiotic relationship, and violence is sometimes part of that relationship. And um, it really does. It inform, it informs my writing, uh, but in a way that I've tried to integrate it. I don't, I don't specifically like to write a lot of stories where you, you front and center it, and then try to make sort of judgments or more morality um, assessments about uh, you know what's you know our relationship with with nature I just sort of take things uh, and I probably do this with human nature in general I just lay it out I obviously I have a point of view but I really try hard not to be to, to moralize I try to just say look this is just these are the facts uh, I'm filtering them through my personality and through my, my ideology, but I still try to be as neutral as possible, as often as possible. Um, and I think, I don't know, I feel like that comes through and I feel like it's, it's something that is, is endlessly fascinating to me, our interactions, not only with each other, but with, with our surroundings. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think it does, that, that attitude that you have of it does come through in your work. It's a, uh, it's inherent. So you're doing it right. I appreciate, or at least at least right to to what the way that you want to do it. Okay. Well, we've got two questions from Roger Venable. The first one says, in your previous "This Is Horror" interview, when discussing well written sentences, you said something like. If you cannot craft a sentence in a way that makes me want to read the next one, then I don't have time to read that. What works would you recommend writers study, either prose fiction or craft-related non-fiction, to learn effective writing at the sentence level? Wonderful. This is, uh, I love, I love that because it, it allows me to talk about there's so many you know the thing is you know we get you get into a, a discussion like this and it's always about well this happened to me or that happened to me or this is what i think but i owe everything 
uh, besides whatever nascent talent that I have in my own discipline, I owe everything to other writers and other artists. Um, we all do. You know, they can't be there. They don't sit you down. Nobody sits you down and puts a typewriter in front of you or sticks a pencil in your hand. That's on you. You get to, you can take credit for, for the effort and you can take credit for execution, but you cannot take credit for, um, you know, basically being a nascent, some kind of a nascent uh, talent. You, everything is, is consumption. So <clears throat> I look at um, so many writers, classic writers uh, and contemporary writers that are good. And, and the thing is, you know, and, and don't miss, and make no mistake, I think there are, in the horror field, there are probably just from, and I, and I gather a lot of this or glean a lot of this from when I was, was, was serving as a juror and a critic, um, or a reviewer, I should say, uh, you know, be exposed to just so much stuff. There are a few hundred, you know, genius writers. Uh, and, I, and I'm not trying to say all geniuses are equal. I mean, there's any more than all black belts are equal, but the point is that whatever threshold, you know, uh, we might we might lay claim to as being a genius. There are lots of them working now in the in the broader. This is the clarification in the broader context? It's a drop in the ocean of writing. And Surgeon, I think, was being optimistic when he was talking about ninety percent of everything is crap. But here's the thing: you will never read one percent of the ten percent. That's you just can't. There is more stuff coming out that is worth reading than you'll ever keep up with if you live multiple lifetimes. So that said, this is just skimming, you know, the very, just stuff off that I, I actually jotted down when I was talking with, uh, with Mike and Bill recently, uh, Brian Evanson, uh, he, he wrote, um, you know, uh, wind Eye is actually one of the great collections, Hugh state, um, the wavering knife. And he's written some, he's written some crime, uh, some crime fiction, one of the greats, uh, Elizabeth Hand, whom I mentioned earlier, her cast Neary sentence level is just it's definitely astounding. Because um, here's because here's the thing: you don't have to be a wordsmith to be an effective or even a wonderful writer. So, you know, uh, there are lots of writers that I grew up with who are not wouldn't be considered wordsmiths particularly or they weren't all the time like for example would be uh, Robert Parker Robert Parker could write a genius sentence if he wanted to uh, but he chose not to generally speaking he chose to do what he did he was much more utilitarian so I don't list him here uh, in the same way they list Brian Evanson Brian Evanson every fucking sentence is polished glass it's just this it's 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 just absolutely beautiful Conrad Williams uh, Peter Straub, and Peter Straub has done quite a bit of, I would say, mystery crime uh, oriented work. Coco, uh, from what I believe it's eighty mid eighties, um, is seminal work in the in the a the slasher uh, genre, serial killer genre, but it also is a really strong entry and just the mystery, you know, uh, uncovering the truth about something, uh, a genre. Um, Gillian Flynn, um, maybe, maybe less so than some of these people who are utterly meticulous. I mean, she, she definitely is more commercially oriented, but my God, she can write a sentence. Um, a little uh, mentioned author, uh, uh, Pierce Hansen, Pierce Hansen, uh, he wrote a he wrote a book called Street Raised a few years ago, and I think he's one of those guys that's sort of ahead of his time. He was writing this neo noir stuff before everybody started, you know, busting their buttons over it. And I would encourage anybody to run out there and, and find that book by by, by uh, Pierce, uh, Donald Ray Pollock, um, and. Of course, we mentioned McDonald, but McDonald, you know, less so. McDonald is more into rhythmic kind of stuff. He's not as meticulous, but he, there is sort of like a more than a sum of its parts kind of effect with him. But uh, one last person is Martin Cruz Smith. I think Martin Cruz Smith is one of the great um, writers who has bridged the commercial literary 
divide. He's got one foot in either world, and um, his his sentence his sentences are are uh, are, are gorgeous. And what a fantastic reading and studying list that you've given us all, and I'll definitely link to all of those writers within the show notes. But yeah, bridging literary and genre fiction, I mean, there there are a, a few writers that have done it, but, you know, a very, very tough thing to do. I think, you know, Brian Evanson has as well. You know, and he's a he's an overnight success, twenty something years in the making. All overnight successes are, aren't they? It's like, oh, look, look at how wonderfully they've done this overnight. Yeah, well, it took a number of decades. Yeah, and he's doing it his own way. He's not, you know, his crime novel, uh, End of Days, uh, is, uh, you know, about the cult of mutilation. I mean, you're just, it's not, it's not commercial. Uh, sensibility wise and yet it's just absolutely astounding. I mean I can't wait till they make a movie out of it. They really should. Uh, another author that I would toss in there um, as a um, absolutely astounding stylist is Livia Llewellyn. She's uh, you know she, she, she doesn't she doesn't bridge anything. She's firmly in the literary world and she just uh, I don't know I kind of, I, I kind of, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for her to bust out because there's always room for the unusual author. You know, we've got Cormac McCarthy. There's room for the Cormac McCarthy, and it seems like it's every every few years. You know, we we allow somebody who isn't uh, straight up commercial, uh, you know, um, inspired to to basically have a success, to have a commercial success. I think she's somebody that could do it. You know, she's just, her, her subject matter is uncompromising. She's she's a, a brutalist in some ways, but so beautifully. You know, where somebody like Elroy is a wonderful stylist, but is he's a brutalist, but he, he, he's staccato, how is right? I mean, he's basically slapping you. He's, he slaps you constantly. Uh, L- Livia, she, she her, her game is, is always, it's sort of like waves. A, you know, it's a wave of violence and 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 brutalism, and yet also can be astonishingly uh, beautiful. Uh, and so that's a, that's another person. If you're looking to take apart how uh, a writer, you know, on the craft level, how a writer puts together engaging, beautiful, uh, descriptive prose, she'd be somebody that I would definitely recommend. Oh, and one other, uh, and this is a really obvious one, but uh, uh, maybe maybe the most obvious one. But I think um, Jim Tom uh, Jim Thompson uh, is yeah is yeah fa- fabulous. Matter of fact, in some ways, and this is going to sound really strange, but it, because they're nothing, their their pro their style is not similar, but the effect is similar. I, I really feel like um, there's something of Thompson's spirit in Livia's in Livia's writing, and they don't. They, they don't, I mean, like I said, you, it, it's, it's, it's more of a, a feeling that I've had on occasion. Um, like this, this strange, almost chuckling uh, ferocity that, that underlies their work, this sort of manic um, hostility. Uh, but but not, not manic hostility, like um, um, genial hostility that, that, that sort of inhabits their writing. Yeah, that's a really interesting pairing and, you know, one that you wouldn't ordinarily make, but I can certainly see where you're coming from there. Well, the second question that Roger has is, which techniques do you prefer as a reader, writer, or both to craft a central mystery for the protagonist to unveil? Are there any that annoy you that you feel are cheating or are just plain bad writing? And then he says, for example, I get irritated when I read a mystery and part or all of the revelation hinges on information the narrator knew the whole time, but the reader did not. Even so, I see this often enough it appears to be an acceptable technique. I think it is, however, 
pretty much the reason Sherlock Holmes stories are told from Dr. Watson's perspective. That's really good stuff. Um, and I haven't really thought about it because I don't, um, if I don't like something, I don't have a tendency, I, I tend to discard it. But yeah, uh, like I really do, do enjoy unreliable, uh, the unreliable narrator, but I, I do fe feel like I'm less enamored of, um, yeah, they, they, they with you know, the very end goes, but I'm the bad guy. I've been the bad guy the whole time. The only way that I like that kind of um, s sort of a construction is if the character has been telling you the whole time and you just weren't listening. In other words, any anything that I perceive as a deficiency of, of a style or technique can be overcome by great story, you know, by other factors within the story. I can, I can forgive it was all a dream if it was told well enough. Um, oh, we're really in hell. You know, I've done that. Uh, if it, but if it's told well enough, I can forgive almost anything. But I do think to some degree it's a cheat. And I do like the idea that, yeah, uh, seeing, it from the, seeing it from the outside is, is a way to kind of have your cake and eat it too, like in the Sherlock Holmes kind of example. I, I got to tell you, though, the, the one that actually drives me, the, I can forgive almost anything or, or look past it, I should say. But the, the thing that I find really tedious as a reader um, is the Mary Sue or Marty Sue character. Like when I was growing up, I had no problem with whatever Sackett, you know, for the Louis L'Amour series, whatever Sackett was telling the story was going to be the best brawler, smartest guy in the, in the West. That's fine. That fastest guy in the fighter, whatever. Uh, I, I could deal with that. I liked the fact that John Carter, no matter how fucked up things were, he, you know, he get dropped in a pit. Uh, supposed to die, and he, you know, with some slave girls and some other, you know, uh, other people, and he ends up with the prince, you know, rescuing the princess who happened to be down there. You know, I that was all fine uh, when I was a kid, when I was not very discriminating in my <laughs> in my literature, but I, I find that it, I find that tedious now, and I, I really have a problem with um, Swiss util, you know, uh, Swiss knife characters, no matter what situation they're in. It's not so much that they handle it the way that a competent person handles things outside their speciality. I, I totally, I totally like that. I mean, you may not, you know, be a ballroom dancer, but maybe, you know, but maybe you can fake it type of thing enough that you don't embarrass yourself. But no, I, I see a lot of fiction and cinema where the central character, you know, uh, is good at everything. You know, skilled in martial arts. Uh, you know. Uh, a photographic memory, you know, on and on and on. I, yeah, that, that, that stuff, that's kind of my, my peeve, is that the character is good at everything. I don't. I find that to be really, uh, you know, tiresome. And, of course, the reverse of it also is tiresome. Is this, I'm not a big fan of the sad sack character either. And this is just my, you know, in both cases, this is my pet peeve. I'm not, I'm not comfortable saying authoritatively there's anything structurally wrong with this. But, you know, the character who's just sort of a miserableist, uh, and that's my problem in a lot of horror too, is I don't really, I, I don't really, I'm not, a, I don't have a problem with characters who have lots of problems and I don't have problems with, with depressed characters, but I just, I find that it gets overdone. It's the character that every, you know, the most interesting th thing that's happened to this character in a long time or the best thing that's happened is the murders that are occurring all around them. Like, ah, now they can love again, you know, kind of a thing. And I, I, I find that that's, it has its place, but I feel like it's overdone. Uh, so well, I think you just have to have well balanced characters. That's, you know, for, for every two good characteristics, you got to have, you know, something that's just deplorable to, to throw in there to make them more realistic. Well, and it's kind of like the Superman syndrome. It's like, you know, it's like, he's, he's so great. Da, 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 you know, but you know, and, 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 some people say, well, you know, Superman's not, he's a terrible character to write about. Nah, not really. Simply because with all of that that he has, he's probably, you know, extremely lonely. And, you know, if you kind of hit on that, that's not necessarily a good quality to have. It's not a bad quality, but, you know, it's, it's a circumstance. But you see what I'm saying? No, I actually, I, I could envision writing a bunch of, 
narratives about Superman that dig deeper than you know what we get because it's it's the it's the law of implication you know if this then that that's actually one of the reasons why I don't write um, science fiction yeah. because or at least not swashbuckling science fiction because there's either for me I would have to either just abandon all reason and just go Star Wars it just works because it does. The star drive on a on an X-wing fighter is no different than the or the hyperdrive than the one on a giant battle cruiser. You both, you, you know, you can take your you can take your X-wing fighter across the universe just the same as you can a battleship. You know, uh, how does this stuff work? Oh, it's magic. You know, you either go that route, which I actually I could do that. That'd be fun. Or you have to go the hardcore Arthur C. Clarke route. You know, where it's all naturalistic and well, this is we can't have this because because of that. Uh, stuff like I could never write stuff like um, uh, Star Trek as much as I love it that inhabits the middle ground because it it always and, and superhero you know and the Marvel universe is doing the same thing is that they ignore the consequences of um, of the big stuff the big central stuff they ignore the well if you have this then what about all this stuff uh, you know if we have some of the technology in Star Trek if you look at that. There's just no way then there would ever be away missions unless it was diplomatic. You'd never send the captain down to the surface of a, a desolate planet. You'd never, why would you send a human being down? You've got data. You've got, I, I would assume, if we, ha if we have robotics at the level we have today, I would think that we would have some pretty sophisticated non-AI robotics that could do anything a person could do in 10 times better uh, traveling around the surface or the or the uh, interior of a planet, there'd be no reason to send people most of the time, and therefore you wouldn't have a show. I mean, especially the old series. Half the time, it's we're down on a planet and three people with red shirts are already dead. What we, what's happening? You know, and they could have they could have sent a probe down and found out all this stuff in the first place. And so there's a lot. There's a, a miniaturization. You know, they ignore, they ignore the fact that well, if you can if you can do this, that, or the other, you know. Uh, beam people across, you know, thousands of miles and rematerialize them. Why do you have a hand phaser? Why, you know, especially uh, the, the Enterprise can actually uh, pinpoint with its phasers uh, targets like person-sized on a planet. And so I, I, I used to tell, you know, I when I was a kid, I would go, well, Captain Kirk would just have uh, contacts that are, uh, he uses brain power to blast people. There would be no reason he would ever carry a hand weapon because the technology would be so advanced, judging by some of the stuff they have, then everything would be miniature. That's always the that's actually the height of uh, of, of civiliza civilization's technology. It's either how big you can make something or how small, uh, and that's what we're finding is that's the biggest. You you can make big things. Everybody gets together and puts a big thing together, no problem, uh, relatively speaking. But it's the it's the how how much smaller can we make it? You look at cell phones from the eighties, where they're like you're carrying around a brick, and today it's people laugh. Actually, we find ourselves laughing at movies from five years ago. We're like, look how huge that calculator sized cell phone is, and we thought it was tiny. Now we're looking at stuff. I guarantee you, within a few years, you aren't going to have a cell phone. You're going to have a little chip, and I think at some point you won't even have that. It'll be it'll be some injectable thing, and so I'm just looking at start. I'm looking at at stuff like that and going. The, it's mind-boggling, it's realistic to extrapolate from just one or two of the, uh, just from one or two technologies that are that are very pronounced and star, are very you know uh, high profile in Star Trek. You you just start crying when you look at the realism, the breakdowns, and you know, and most people don't care about that. They just want a good, fun TV show. They don't want to think about it too deeply. But as a creator, I can't, I can't. I just go, I go nuts. I I have a problem with with writing just regular crime fiction like. You know, always worrying about well, if these people did this, but how come they didn't had, didn't do something over there? And it, it's something that whenever I'm watching it or reading it, I find myself asking a lot of questions that authors probably or creators would wish I didn't. Yeah, now you've ruined Star Trek for me because I've never thought of it that way. No, I'm just kidding. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's like why uh, couldn't he? <clears throat> you know, but at the same time, you know, that's one of the things because I always. I'm like you. I always, I, I love writing about criminals. I don't know necessarily be a crime fiction, but the reason why is because, you know, kind of going tying in what you're saying, they are unpredictable. They don't think everything through. They're desperate, usually, 
And because that's how they they've lived, they've lived, you know, sometimes you, you run across a character who's just been on the run forever. That decision making process is not very strong, you know. And of course, if they had a perfect decision making process, you wouldn't, you know, it goes back to the thing, you know, especially with horror, you know, if you horror can't exist unless you have a bad decision. So, if the, you know, if their decision making was at top level, then you would have you wouldn't have really any, any type of crime story. Well, know? it's the yeah, it's the myth of the I touch on that uh, in the second novel, the myth of the genius serial killer or the master criminal. You know, uh, and, and just speaking as a, you know, as a writer, not not about the, the stories or anything, but yeah, mm-hmm. our, our master criminals all have the honorable or CEO or or uh, senator in front of their you know in, as a title. It's not Jim Bob, uh, you know, the master the master criminal living you know in the Appalachian somewhere. That's not or in the city or whatever. It's not the case. Matter of yeah. fact, actually, I think our president, so called, is actually a, a perfect sort of exemplar of the of the idiot uh, criminal who's fulfills the Peter principle. You know, he's 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 been promoted beyond his level of competence. That that was the whole Peter principle: is you always, you know, you will always be promoted to your level of incompetence, uh, or and then beyond. That's the breaking point. But the point is, is that you know, part of the reason that his that he and his uh, supporters are really nervous about investigations is uh, not about the i don't think they're i think this whole idea of russian collusion is uh, you know a fishing uh, uh, you know uh, uh, that may be the, the the great white whale you know that they'll never catch but i do think dirty dealings and con uh, you know less glamorous stuff like oh yeah you know he's paid a lot of people to shut up he hasn't paid hasn't paid a lot of other people illegally uh money coming for projects from from bad places st- stupid falsified papers that kind of stuff where which which will all come crashing down at some point uh i think that's a total uh total possibility or even probability you know uh as one analyst once you know said about him uh he would have made more money with his inheritance if he would have just left it in the in the bank or the stock market and just invested it he's he's actually you know uh, everybody brags about how much money he likes to brag about how much money he's made, but actually, he's done worse than it would have done if he just would have left it in investment portfolios all these years. And so I just, you know, and periodically somebody like him gets nabbed, and you go, "How come this person wasn't nabbed years ago?" Because when they start breaking down, it's like everybody knew they weren't particularly competent. They just were brazen, and they had a enabling network. It's worked with mafia dons, you know. Uh, and, and lower level people for forever. Uh, sometimes you've got a few, a handful that are super smart and they may be master criminal level, but generally it's just, no, oh, they had power. They had friends also, you know, uh, they were able to basically stay out of trouble because of, because of those elements, you know, and then one day, uh, the right, the right, the right person came along and the right circumstance, you know, the right, basically the prevailing mood was uh, to take them down and they take them down. And then you ask yourself, why didn't this happen a long time ago? So I think there's, there's something for that. And there's also something that, uh, you know, criminals are creatures of habits. So they have a tendency to, even if they know it's not going to end well for them, they have a tendency to just revert to what they've done before. And it happens with regular people, you know, civilians too. It's just that the consequences are always uh, less like, Oh, I keep, I keep going out with people who aren't the right person for me. The same things keep happening in my, my jobs and my relationships. It's just that when it's a criminal under, you know, undertaking, the consequences are more dramatic. Oh, definitely. And the thing that I always see in those type of people is they individ- they end up being brought down by something that you would think is a non-issue at first. You know, it's kind of like uh, the aliens in uh, War of the Worlds. You know, they got brought down by a common cold. You know, so it's going to be like when you have someone, you know, like our, you know, commander in chief, he's, you know, all this stuff is Russia, all this kind of stuff. It's going to be one little thing that initially you're going to be like, oh, that ain't no big deal. But then eventually it's going to be like, oh, wow, that was a lot bigger than we thought it was. And there's a lot more secrets and a lot more hidden. 
So it's yep. it, it's interesting. Yep. Well, Andrew M. Reichardt's question, I feel, is along similar lines. Um, and he would like to know, he says, how can crime fiction avoid validating right-wing law and order values, even breaking the simplistic black hat versus white hat model by including elements such as bad apple cops or showing people committing crimes for good reasons, can all too easily just leave the audience finding the bad apple humanized and relatable and shrugging at the unfortunate but quote-unquote inevitable punishment of the good criminal. Well, that's interesting. I'm kind of curious. Like, I'm just thinking of... um, cinema you know tv how many narratives do we have like in in procedurals where it's um i guess there's a few you, know, you have criminal like law and order uh you know where it's always every now and then the criminal you feel sorry for them but generally speaking uh you're on the side of law enforcement but i, I do think there's been a proliferation of um the bad guys being uh, if not sympathetic, um, central. And I, and I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how you, I'm not even sure if it's desirable to, to worry about that because here's the thing is law and order essentially right wing is, would be one of my, one of my questions. I think the reflex would be to say yes, but is that to say that if you're a progressive, you don't believe in, uh, a criminal justice system? I mean, I think right now there's a lot of people on the left who are quite, uh, and for a variety of reasons, hopeful that that our special counsel uh, exacts justice. But what, what, here's one of the things, though, that I that I see people saying, and especially on the left, if you divorce if you divorce some of the stuff that's surrounding uh, the commander in chief, as Bob says, uh, there's a lot of bad actors who are being who are being netted. There, I mean that. Uh, that one, you know, uh, fellow, old Paul Manafort, looking at 300 years, uh, and some of that has to do with conspiracies against the U.S., but it's also uh, lying, cheating, dirty deals, you know. And I know a lot of people are, are happy to see that person going. They're, the idea is that a lot of a, a lot of people are happy to see bad actors being scooped up, and not necessarily punitively because they're because they're because they're angry at uh, a Republican in office, but just like no, these people should be scooped up. And and I have to say to their credit, plenty of people on the left were were even though they were uh, sad, were were behind Al Franken, you know, being removed. And Al Franken was a terrible loss politically speaking, uh, strategically, and yet uh, most people on the left were were like, hey, hey, this is the fair thing. So I don't know. Uh, I, I think that the institutions have a tendency to be right wing. Like, that's why it's so absurd to say, oh, there's some kind of anti-Republican conspiracy at the at the FBI when it is historically a right wing, uh, you know, rigid, um, kind of overzealous, uh, potentially in the past, organization. Uh, but the idea, though, that in a larger context, that that law and order is is by default a right wing um, proposition. I'm not, and I'm pro- possibly I'm getting the question, you know, not quite apprehending it correctly. But I kind of reject that that idea. I, I think that there are plenty of people uh, who are would self identify as progressives, also want limited crime on the streets and stuff like that. And I think that what you get it weighed into is the whole shades of gray issue. Um, there are a lot of people on the left, for example, who don't, you know, who think that petty drug, um, infractions should not be clogging up our legal system. That doesn't mean though, that they are necessarily soft on crime. It's just that they have a different point of view when it comes to what constitutes, uh, a clear and present danger to our society. So, so in other words, I, I think both, I, I think there's something to be said that everybody to some degree is invested in a safe, uh, you know, um, 
I don't know, strong, uh, strong legal system and, a, and basically the pursuit of criminals. Is, it comes down to, though, who do you feel empathy with uh, and, and, who, and who do you not feel empathy with? Uh, and as far as how we how we deal with that, I, I, the biggest step that I've seen, there was a lot of vig, there's a lot of vigilantism in crime fiction. I mean, Jack Reacher, there's an example for you. I don't know where the author falls politically, but Jack Reacher is definitely, you know, there's he's an ex military guy and and all this stuff. And so you there, there's both sides of the aisle could kind of try to claim him as their as their uh, kind of avatar. And yet, you know, the left we, we could also like him just because he he completely skirts, you know, use extra extra judicial methods to to do the right thing. He's a he's a vigilante. So uh, I don't know. I don't I don't know that necessarily that there's a problem to be solved. I think I think what it is is that there's a variety of um, solutions or approaches to this question, and you just as a reader you have a buffet you can you can read the right wing thriller stuff where everything is you know gung ho jack you know or yeah jack bauer kind of solutions to everything or you can go with you know breaking bad where we're we're, we're feeling uh, sympathetic for not uh, walter white but for his henchman uh, jesse jesse uh, pinkman oh, i definitely agree with that it's to me the shades of gray are infinitely more interesting than leaning one way or the other. Well, and I think it all, I guess, like I said, I'd have to listen to the question again. I might even have to analyze it. It was a very well thought out and long question, but ultimately though, I just feel it's not for me. It's not even what's interesting or not. It's just looking at it objectively. You get to pick what you want to read. So in other words, I don't think there is a problem. I think some people are going to, to write in a way that the questioner is going to go, yeah, see, right-wing solutions and but there's going to be plenty of other authors who are on the other end of it or in the middle or somewhere or somewhere along that line and i just think we live in a we live in a time of um plenty because i wouldn't i don't i guess as a writer i don't even if i'm not interested in something i actually think generally speaking uh it's better that things exist than they don't in other words i don't like uh, right-wing thrillers. I don't like um, John Grisham style stuff. No, no offense to Mr. Grisham, but that doesn't his stuff doesn't interest me. I'm glad that it exists alongside Martin Cruz Smith because I think it's important to have a dialogue, and you can't have a dialogue if we're all in absolute agreement on stuff. Definitely. Well, we don't normally take questions from. Twitter, but and you may have seen this, but I thought this is too good to pass up. So, at Bruce Redux said, I dearly hope someone asks for practical advice on alibi construction and evidence disposal. So, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> okay. I, I actually saw that. I didn't brood on it, but I did, I did think about it. What I could say about alibi construction, just from <laughs> lots of uh, you know reading lots of true crime and actual crime, uh, it's always a significant other that turns in the criminal. So you, you're, you, you're, you, the bank robber gets turned in by his mom or a girlfriend or his buddy. So basically, you can't tell your significant other if you're a criminal. You know, unless you're unless the other person's in on it, you need to keep that in mind. And I, I, I don't have any advice for actually creating an alibi. I'm just saying, statistically, uh, it's a bad thing if your girlfriend knows that you're a you're a you're a bank robber. Um, that's going to come back on you sooner or later. Uh, evidence disposal. Yeah, this is pretty macabre, but I, I thought about that. Uh, pets, pets are. Pets are good at evidence disposal. Uh, there was a, a case up in, this is horrible. There was a case up in Alaska. I want to say the late eighties. It was, it was not too long, you know, early nineties, not too long before I left, but uh, a guy had gotten into a, an altercation with an associate and I don't think intentionally killed him, but they killed him, but they fed him to their, uh, 
fed them to their dogs. And he had he, he had a recreational team of huskies, and so he cooked up the he cooked up the victim and and fed him to the animals. And the only reason that they the only reason that they caught him is because he because he cooked him. And somebody smelled the cooking and was like, "That's horrible." If he would have just uh, quartered him up and or parted him and tossed him to the the huskies, uh, he would have been fine. So, you know, keep your pets in mind if you have if you have a body to dispose of. Yeah. <laughs> and don't cook the victim. <laughs> yeah, the cooking there, part was just uh, not smart. Yeah, there's your horror and crime right there. <laughs> yeah. I've been I'm one of those and very uh unfortunate individuals that have that has smelled uh burning flesh, human uh cuz uh Years, years, and years ago, there was a, a accident, and uh, this uh, poor soul got got burnt pretty good. And you know they're okay, but whew, that kind of you don't forget about that. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, from cooking bodies, we're gonna move on to supernatural fiction because Jennifer Grindstaff is putting together a horror course that she's teaching and she's looking for supernatural shorter works to teach. Um, At the moment, she's got The Hellbound Heart, The Yellow Wallpaper, various Poe and Lovecraft stories, Blood Child, The Portrait of Dorian Gray, and Each Thing I Show You is a Piece of My Death. I wonder, are there any other shorter supernatural works that you would add and that you would recommend that she teach on her course? Well, um, shorter. Cause I, I, I really, I really enjoy some, some longer or novellas. So I don't know if she's teaching. I have to hear that list again. If anything's novella linked on there, but if she was, if she were going to take a novella, I would say, um, everybody would have their different favorite here, but I really am a huge fan of, um, T.D. Klein, and I would highly recommend um, any one of the four stories in Dark Gods, which came out in the 80s, 85, I believe. Or if I did, it came out around the same time as Coco uh, by Straub. Uh, so these two of my favorite books, and there's four novellas in there. Uh, and if I had to pick one of those to recommend, it would be um, T.D. That would be that would be one. Um, I think any number of stories by uh, Brian Evanson, uh, would be good. I read one recently that uh, in his collapse of horses called Blood Drip. Oh, it's so short. It's just, you know, five pages or something like that. One of the great, I don't even know what to call I actually, I'm getting the creeps. I'm sitting here thinking about it, and I actually have goosebumps on my body. My skin's crawling thinking about that story. Uh, run out and buy uh Claps of horses, and just so you could read that story. That's uh, there's another one in there called Black Bark, which is uh, which is super good. Uh, another one that I would recommend would be uh, The Rebel by um, my good friend John Langan. It's a deconstruction of uh, it's a novelette, so it's like 10, 12,000 words, but uh, it's a deconstruction of uh, if you haven't read it, it's a deconstruction of the werewolf tale, and it's told in. He kind of switches up, but it's basically told in second person. But it's it's it, it starts off with a werewolf chasing chasing someone, and it just it it basically it's it's it talks about how you know how werewolf kills are portrayed in cinema and fiction, how uh, transformation is to it basically he breaks down every aspect of the popularized werewolf story, and then you know he he puts he he reframes it as a, a sort of a meta narrative, and that's. One of the best, best things I've read, uh, and almost anything by Stephen Graham Jones. She could just basically reach into a hat and pull out, uh, you know, a story by him or Gemma Files. You know, as, as she picked every uh, piece, you know, thing I show is a piece of or every thing I show is a piece of my death. She could have picked any number of stories by Gemma Files uh, also, but uh, Stephen Graham Jones, he wrote, also wrote a werewolf story. Um, I don't have the title of it in front of me. It's this odd title, but it's in his um, The Ones That Got Away collection. And uh, there's a story in there called Teeth, 
which is a serial killer story. That would be a supernatural serial killer story. That's another one. So these are, you know, these are some, those are some people and some stories that you could not, could not go wrong uh, breaking down for a class. In that story by Stephen Grant Jones called Wolf Island. Yeah, yeah. It's, that is good. It's one of the most. It's it's just such a good story. Oh yeah. It's it's it really is for multiple reasons. That is just. And teeth scared me. Te- teeth about the detective looking for this guy who eats. Somebody's like vomiting up fingers. They they cut them off or chew them off and then they throw them up. It's like an owl. He talks about owls and stuff. But the point is, is that Stephen Graham Jones. We could we could do a show just me talking about Stephen Graham Jones. Stephen Graham Jones is. Um, he and Brian Evanson, Livy Llewellyn, and Gemma, my God, you know, what she's been doing lately. Those are just some of the finest writers around. But Stephen Graham Jones, for my money, is he has got to be in the top five authors working, you know, in English. I, I, I really, really cannot say enough about his ability. And I, uh, you know, I'm so glad that uh, he had a, a big publishing success with mongrels here a couple of years ago. And I hope he, hope he gets more of them because he just, he deserves a lot of, uh, a lot more people should be reading his stuff. Oh yeah. I'll second that. Oh, definitely. You know, everybody that you read leaves an imprint on you, whether you like their stuff or don't like it, it doesn't matter. They, they leave some kind of a mark. Um, and I don't consciously, uh, look for cues from, from, from too many peers, I try to actually, you know, like I said, I I focus on a lot of the of, of more the older authors, but I would have to say that um, Jones is somebody who I constantly feel uh, inspired by. In other words, I always feel like he's he's somebody that um, influences me to some degree, you know, and, and consciously. Like, like, I'm, like, like, you know, obviously there's lots of writers who influence me subconsciously. And there's lots of writers who have a specific story. I'm like, oh, my God. But he, I think, just in general, his writing is a strong influence on me. Like, uh, you know, currently. Yeah. Yeah, he consistently delivers the goods. And that's that's about as, you know, well, I just, about as good as you can get. I agree. And I, I feel like I... With him, with my connection to him is on his writing is on multiple levels. As a reader, obviously, yeah. But I feel like I'm, I feel, and it's part of it has to do with personality. You just, you connect with certain things. But I feel, but I feel, I feel like I'm constantly learning stuff from his from his work. That's, it, 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 you know, and and I'm I'm aware of it. I'm aware that oh, okay. He and Peter Straub are two writers whom. I feel th- that are working today that I feel like, okay, I just learned something. I learned something about craft from them. Uh, and I can't pay you a higher compliment. I mean, I just, I feel like they, I feel like their very existence. There's tons of, there's tons of, of, of writers from my youth who, whom I feel this way about, but it's different. It's a weird, you know, it's not a weird experience for me taking apart McDonald, a dead author. It's different though, when I'm watching, uh, Straub or, or Jones, and they're and they're continuing to work, and they're evolving. But I feel like in real time, you know, I'm uh, that that I'm always picking up something new from them, and it's it's uh, I can't you know that that for me would be the highest compliment I could I could pay you. Definitely. Well, to finish off, what is the worst advice that you hear given to writers? Oh, you know. It's such a t- touchy subject because people get really wound up. I think that's one of the aspects of Facebook and Twitter and whatnot is people really get angry at authoritative advice. And so I'm not going to I don't I don't think I want to say anything about what the worst advice is because I would I actually I would have to think about that. I mean, anything that I come up with would be so obvious, you know. Um, so I, but let me but let me say this. I think how I think people take advice incorrectly. Right. I think people look advice. Here's a. I think people should look at advice, um, especially from established authors. So we'll just go ahead and winnow it down to people 
who you know we think should know better or at least have something to offer um some kind of practical experience and i i think the way that people look at it that is incorrect is that they always think it applies to them everything's about me so if if a writer, you know, uh, actually last year, a very prominent writer that's a friend of ours on Facebook, he said, look, you should be writing every day. And this is, but this is, but he also prefaced it by saying, look, this is what works for me. Somebody, he, cause he teaches classes too. He does everything. This is why I'm kind of picking him. He's been successful writing tie-in novels. He's also written originals. Uh, he's made a living as a professor, you know, a writing professor and as a, as a novelist, He's had a working career for you know twenty something years, and it covers, like I said, a, a, this whole array of things that he's done. So he's coming at it from, and, and also as an educator, and he says, "Look, this is just what has worked for me. It may not work for you." And I think people forget that part right there. Then everything he says after, though, they completely ignore. It. They're like, "You're saying I have to write every day." Well, you know what? If you can't write every day, you can't write every day. But you're saying that's the only way to succeed. That's not what. That's not what he's saying. He's saying this is how he succeeded. I, I think, you know, possibly if people say something and they insist this is the only way to do it, well, then that's obviously, you know, if someone's adamant that there's only one way to write a story or there's only one method process, then that might be your default. Everybody knows that's incorrect because even in more rigid disciplines, there's usually some flexibility in how you achieve, uh, you know, mastery. And so, 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 so that's rare, though. It's very rare. So, somebody gets on their high horse and says that. But I mean, I think we can, reasonable people can go, yeah, yeah, that person was just carrying on. But I, th but I think that there's this overreaction, like a vampire to garlic kind of reaction uh, to people saying confidently, this is what I did, and I think this will work for a lot of people. I, I think we'll be a lot happier uh, if, if we just acknowledge the fact that even though it may be good advice or it may even be have a you know have a lot of truth in it it may not apply to you and you don't have to you don't have to get either force yourself to follow it because you you know you're just going to go ahead and blindly say okay that's the only way to do it or because you know or overreact uh, saying well you know i can't do that therefore it's terrible advice just be, just because the advice doesn't apply to you doesn't mean uh, that it's not good advice so in other words if you if somebody says hey Writing consistently, if not every day, but consistently. If you want to be, if you want to get books out there, you're probably going to have to sit down and actually type consistently. If that pisses you off, it says more about you than than the person, you know, giving that advice. Because an adult should be able to say, "Well, I've got four kids and uh, three jobs, and I don't have time to write every day." Instead of instead of raging at the person who says, "Look, you, this is you know the." the most efficacious way to do it, you should probably just, you know, say to yourself, well, you know, I'm an adult and I can, I, I understand what they're saying, that ideally this would be the way to do it. And I, and, and, and so instead I'm going to write 10 minutes a day. Like Lansdale, he, he says, hey, if, you, if you've got time to sit down and rest your weary bones for 10 minutes and watch TV, you had 10 minutes to write. And that's extreme, but it's also true. And, and, and so, and so the, the bottom line is, is that I think there, when it comes to advice, I'm to the point where I, I used to, uh, not that I'm anyone to be, you know, some authority on how to do stuff, but I'm inclined to say, hey, look, you know, I've been doing this for a while, and here's some things that worked for me, and here's things that didn't. I don't do much of that anymore because people are so pissy, and I'm kind of like, well, then, you know, why should I, outside of maybe helping, you know, I have I have people that I'm mentoring behind the scenes, you know, why should I bother then, and. I try not to feel that way about it, but I do see, I do feel like Facebook has kind of created this sort of adversarial thing. And, and people, like I said, people make it about them. Instead of just going, hey, so-and-so, you know, this is what they're saying. Uh, maybe it'll work for you, maybe it won't. They're like, well, I can't do it, so therefore it's invalid. And I don't know. I, that actually uh, has been kind of on my mind. Because uh, you want to pay it forward, but I got to admit, there are some there are some people who make it very difficult to to pursue that right yeah and i think all advice i mean just apply the bruce lee approach absorb what is useful discard what is not well yeah absolutely and the corollary being i see stuff like 
advice that ruins writers, which is the biggest crock of shit I've ever heard. If you can be ruined, then you probably it basically if you can be if you can be oppressed, then maybe that's what you maybe you shouldn't be writing the, or, 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 or weaving your baskets or whatever the fuck it is. The bottom line is I see this all the time and I couldn't disagree with it more. So and so said that you should write every day. Now a bunch of writers who can't will just throw down their pencils and not write because life is interfering and they've given up. Well, maybe they should. That's because if you're not mature enough to know that there are gradients that that basically this is a that that, that, that this is a starting point and you do what you can to you know uh, in relation to that, then I, I'm not sure how you get through your day. I don't know who dresses you or whatever. I mean that's I, I really. I, I actually, because t to me, it's it's one thing to say, well, I disagree with that advice, or it's not for me. It's another thing to hop on your your Twitter feed or your Facebook feed and be yelling that that person is trying to ruin ruin the careers of a bunch of other writers. I think that is because that's kind of what was happening with this guy. I was talking about a small, admittedly small group of people basically said that that advice is going to hurt other writers. And I, like I said, it, it's bullshit. It basically, if you think you know, if somebody says something innocuous, like, I don't know, if you want to be a marathon runner, you should probably run. Uh, you know, if you want to be a writer, you probably need to write. You know, to me, it's reasonable people can disagree with how much is necessary. What's not reasonable is to say that that's poison being injected into the, the body, the, the body of, of writers. I, I just find that to be, um, I don't know. I think there's some projection going on there. I think it's, I think it's like I said. I think it says far less about the person giving that advice than the people reacting to it negatively. Right. So there you go. Probably more than you ever, more than you ever uh, thought you'd get from the from the innocuous advice yeah. section of the, of the discussion. <laughs> yeah. Well, so many people are full of excuses, aren't they? And as you said in the podcast we did with you back in January, with writing, you've just got to put in the fucking work. Well. Let me make this clear. I empathize with not being able to get writing done because of legitimate, overwhelming responsibility. I'm not, and I don't believe, and, listen, and I don't believe in absolutes like if you don't write every day, you're not a writer. Let me make this very clear. I don't think that you have to have, uh, to, to, for me to consider you, you know, as if this is important or not, but since this is the conversation, I don't look down on somebody who doesn't have X amount of books or doesn't write every day. Uh, I, I don't think there's some kind of, I, I think the bar for being considered a professional writer, there's this, it's very nebulous and it's very, I, I don't think it's even worth arguing about unless you're trying to acquire credits to join an organization. Uh, but in general, if I'm sitting at a table with you and you say to me, Hey, I'm a writer. I don't care whether I've heard of you or not. You're a writer. That's fine. What I'm responding to isn't, how people identify themselves or what they do. It's just, I think it's a really unkind repayment of, you know, someone's time and thoughts to, to, to accuse them of, of, of damaging, of, of damaging writers by giving, by giving what I think is a completely innocuous advice. There is nothing outrageous about saying about any profession that you should pursue it and that you should do it consistently. Whether you whether whether you're literal and you say every day, or whether that that every day is actually just shorthand for listen, dude, you know, just write. You can never go wrong writing, you know. And then we can we can split hairs like, oh well, you know, research is more important, and you should spend your life living. And reasonable people can disagree about uh, about the particulars, but disagreement isn't venom, and I and I see a lot of venom, and that's that's the. That's really the only thing that I'm responding to. I'm not responding to disagreement, and I'm not responding to whether people live up to somebody's ideal. I'm just saying, if I say, if I come on my web page and I say, hey, look, this is how I've done it. I think this is a great idea to do it this way. You might try it. Don't come at me because I'm not, I'm not receptive to your, to your bullshit at all. If you don't agree with it, that's fine. But don't tell me that I hurt you by saying it because that's... I don't know. I, I've never experienced it personally, but I just, it, I, I do grind my teeth over this. I think this is actually one of the issues that, that, that I see uh, occurring in the writing community over and over is this 
people, you know, they, they can't or don't, or they're having, you know, problems getting their own writing done. And so when someone offers up a theory about how to, how to do it better, and, 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 and it could be word quote, it could be quotas. I don't agree with quotas, but I don't think that uh, anyone's being damaged if, if writer X down the road says, hey, you know, a thousand words a day is what I think you need to do. I think we might laugh uh, or something, but I don't, but I, I just, I think it's silly to promote that to the level that it was like a public enemy kind of a thing. Definitely. All right. Well, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Not really. I, as you know, uh, last time I really enjoyed being on and, uh, I'm glad that we got to talk about, uh, various writers and things that are going on in the field. And I just, you know, it's, uh, I feel, I feel very lucky, uh, to have been able to put in, put in a, a certain amount of work, uh, and be rewarded with, um, you know, the opportunity to write these, these collections I've written and, and the novels that I've written and, and, it looks like I'll be able to do more of them uh, at this rate. So, uh, you know, it's a lot of work and uh, it's, it's a very, uh, you know, doing it full time is a very uncertain endeavor, but I just want to say to all the people listening, you know, that, that uh, your patrons and whatnot and the people who buy my work, I really but thank you guys for listening. And I thank you guys for reading because, um, you know, I wouldn't have the opportunity to continue to do what I've been doing for, for all these years, if, if not, if not for everybody out there, who's, who's interested. And, uh, I think, I thank you all very much. And thank you for another really wonderful and enjoyable conversation and very best of luck with blood standard. Yes, definitely. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for listening to our conversation with Laird Barron. Join us again next week when we'll be talking with Paul Michael Anderson. Of course, as always, if you want to get that conversation ahead of the crowd, all you need to do is become our patron, one of our sponsors this week. Head on over to www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Pledge your dollar. Get early bird access to every episode, including the interview with Paul Michael Anderson. Get our patrons only Q&A sessions and submit questions for each and every guest. www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. And now for our second sponsor, Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like podcasts of Stephen King? Do you like spooky magazines? Good news! Now you can have a St- Stephen King podcast, Castle Rock Radio. And you can have a spooky magazine, Dark Moon Digest. All you have to do, go to www.patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. Have a scary day! Of course, another way that you can support the podcast is to leave us a review over on iTunes. And our latest review is from Dino Parenti. He gives us five stars and he says, T.I.H. really delivers the goods. Michael and Bob and the occasional Dan sighting provide great insight and wit with their interviews. I always find myself inspired after each one. Dino, thank you so much for such a glowing review. Thank you for all your support and thank you for all your shares and your likes over on social media. We really appreciate it. All right, to wrap up, I would like to leave you with a quote. And this is from the closing chapter of Tim Ferriss's Tribe of Mentors. It is a book that you have probably noticed that I've quoted from a lot. Maybe my favourite non-fiction book of the last year or so. And this is Tim talking about lifestyle design. And by that I mean just setting up a great life. A great way to operate, to work and to live. So this quote is part of his summation as to how one can live a great life. 
based on everything I've seen, a simple recipe can work. Focus on what's in front of you. Design great days to create a great life. And try not to make the same mistake twice. That is it. So I'll leave you with that to ponder. And I would recommend that you pick up Tribe of Mentors by Tim Ferriss. I'll see you next week when we're chatting with Paul Michael Anderson. But until then, look after yourself. Be good to one another. Read horror and have a great, great day.